after her fourth cheery. Unfriendly-like. I'm sure I've offered him a cup at once. I've offered it a hundred times. Never wanted to mix, he didn't. Ah, now, said a woman at the bar. He had a hard war, Frank. He liked the quiet life. There's no reason to. Who else had a key to the back door then, barked the cook. There's always been a spare key hanging from the gardener's cottage far back as I can remember. Nobody forced the door open last night. No broken windows. All Frank had to do was creep on the big house while we were sleeping. The villagers exchanged dirty looks. I always thought, the man, I always thought he had a nasty look about him right enough, grunted the man at the bar. War turned him funny if you ask me, said the landlord. Told you I wouldn't like to get on the wrong side of Frank tonight, Dot, said the excited woman in the corner. Horrible temper, said Dot, nodding feverently. I remember when he was a kid. The following morning, hardly anyone in Little Hangleton doubted that Frank Bryce had killed the Riddles. But over at the neighboring station of Grey Hangleton, the dark and dingy police station, Frank was stumblingly repeating again and again that he was innocent and the only person he had seen near the house on the day of the riddle's death had been a teenage boy, a stranger, dark haired and pale. No one else, nobody else in the village had seen any such boy, and the police were quite sure Frank had invented him. Just when things were looking very serious for Frank, the report on the riddle's bodies came back and changed everything. The police had never read an auto report. A team of doctors had examined the bodies and concluded none of the riddles had been poisoned, stabbed, shot, strangled, suffocated, or as far as they could tell, harmed at all. In fact, the report continued in a tone of unmistakable, unmistakable bewilderment. The riddles had all appeared to be in perfect health, apart from the fact they were all dead. The doctors did know, as though determined to find something wrong with the bodies, that each of the riddles had a look of terror upon his or her face. But, as the frustrated, frustrated police said, whoever heard of three people being frightened to death? As there was no proof that the Riddles had been murdered at all, the police were forced to let Frank go. The Riddles are buried in Little Hangington Churchyard, and their graves were made objects of curiosity for a while. To everyone's surprise, and amid in clouds of suspicion, Frank Bress returned to his cottage on the grounds of the Riddle House. As far as I'm concerned, he'd kill him, and I don't care what the police say, said the dot in the hangman, hangman. And if he had any decency, he'd leave, knowing he how as how we know he did it. But Frank did not leave. He stayed to tend the garden for the next family who lived in the riddle house, and then the next. For neither family stayed long. Perhaps it was partly because of Frank that the new owner said there was a nasty feeling about the place, which, in the absence of inhabitants, started to fall into despair. The wealthy man who owned the riddle house these days neither lived nor put it to any use. They said in the village that they kept it for tax reasons, though nobody was clear what might these be. The wealthy owner continued to pay Frank to do the gardening, however. Frank was nearing his seven, 77th birthday now, very deaf, his bad legs stiffer than ever, but he could have been pottering around the flower, flower beds in fine weather, even though the weeds were starting to creep on him. Try as he might to suppress them. Weeds were not the only thing in Frank he had to contend with either. Boys from the village made a habit of throwing stones through the windows of the Riddle House. They rode their bikes over the lawns Frank had worked so hard to keep smooth. Once or twice, they broke into the old house for a dare. They knew, the old, they knew that old Frank's devotion to the house and grounds amounted almost to an obsession, and it amused them to see him limping to the road's garage, brandishing a shake his stick, and yelling croakily at them. Frank, for his part, believed the boys tormented him because, like their parents and grandparents, thought he was a murderer. So when Frank woke up one night in August and saw something very odd in the old house, he merely assumed that the boys had gone one step further in their attempts to punish them. It was Frank's bad leg that had woke him up. It was painting worse than ever in his old age. He got up and limped downstairs, to the kitchen with the idea of refilling his hot water bottle to ease the stiffness in his leg. Standing at the sink, filling the kettle, he looked up at the riddle house and saw lights glimmering in its upper windows. Frank knew at once what was going on. The boys had broken into the house again, and judging by the flickering quality of light, 
they had started a fire. Frank had no telephone, and in any case, he deeply mistrusted the police ever since they had taken him for questioning about the riddle's death. He put down the kettle at once, hurried 